Hello, I am Deb Coviello, the Drop-In CEO, and I want to thank you again for joining us on another episode where week after week, I get introduced to these most amazing guests who share their insights with you. And along the way, they inspire me and I do hope they inspire you. And week after week, we bring this content to you because we sincerely care about the C-suite leader to help them navigate challenges with confidence. And this week, it is my pleasure to introduce introduce Brian Byro, who is America's breakthrough speaker, having delivered 1,900 presentations worldwide over the last 34 years, the author of 16 books, including his bestseller, Beyond Success, and his brand new Lessons from the Legends. Brian has degrees from Stanford University, UCLA, and has appeared on Good Morning America and CNN. Brian was honored as one of the top 100 interactive speakers in North America and one of the top motivational speakers in the world. It is my honor to welcome you onto the show, Brian. Thank you so much, Deb. I'm looking forward to this conversation. And a quick shout out to Mariana who introduced us. I love the network. They keep introducing me to these most amazing people, but I wanted to bring Brian on after this really, really great discovery call because uh, obviously he talks about leadership, but really brings different perspectives to not only help the C-suite leader approach things differently to get a different outcome, but also for the leaders of tomorrow. And so uh, not only am I inspired as him being a speaker because that is my uh, pursuit as well. But Brian, I'm going to stop talking and hand the floor to you and share a bit about your story with my listeners. Well, thanks, Deb. You know, I, I, I love what I do. So I'm so excited that you're moving more and more into the speaking world because it's it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to, to ignite people. You know, I, people say I'm a motivational speaker. I'm a motivated speaker because motivation must become internal, but we can be the sparks that can help people to ignite. So I've had a great time. Uh, it, I've had actually three careers, all of which created a different pathway to leadership. Um, my first career, I went to Stanford University, graduated. The way I went through school, though, was by by putting myself through school, through coaching swimming. And I loved it. And so uh, all my buddies were going to law school and business school. And I said, you know, I'm going to build a swimming school. So I built my swimming team and it became a, a, a huge team, um, had a great time. And uh, I learned so much that you, the one thing we all got to understand about teaching, coaching, leading is that everyone's different. And that even though I coach swimming, I was really coaching people, helping these young people to build confidence, helping these young people to understand the, the value in both succeeding and in their eyes, not doing as well as they hoped to learn how to win, to learn how to, how to build from losses, learn from both. So um, that was a great first career. Um, I probably still would be doing it, except I had no life. And uh, as we talked about before, I'm probably the only person, you know, who went to graduate school to get a life instead of a job. <laughs> and I ended up getting both. Um, that's when I met my wife, uh, went to UCLA, had a great time, ended up going in my corporate career. So I was in that C-suite. I was a uh, vice president of two pretty large companies. Um, again, I realized that though one was in transportation and one was in um, team training, it was all about people. We're all in the people business. It's how you grow and help others grow that determine how far you can go. And um, so I had a wonderful time. And, uh, we had a magnificent um, turnaround in the, in the transportation company I was VP for, but I didn't love transportation. I loved the people. And that's when I actually started doing team building to break through those silos that had developed in our company. You know, operations didn't like sales, sales didn't like operations. They both didn't like the home office a little bit more. And that just didn't work for me because the differences are actually pluses when we really bring them together. So um, these team building events really kind of turn those silos into synergy. And uh, we had an incredible turnaround. And at the peak of it, I said to my wife, honey, we're doing great. Let's quit. I got to go do this. And so for the last 34 years, I've been speaking to organizations worldwide um, and loving every single one of those 1900 events. So this conversation is really about me learning from you as well. My listeners just happen to benefit from it. But before we go into that, you talk about 
let's quit. <laughs> and that's a scary thing. And then you say, you said, I'm going to pursue this. Your partner in crime, your partner in life said, let's do it. But what enabled you to be able to do that? Because so many people don't have even the courage to say, let's just do it. Let's go all in. Well, you know, I think that so many of us live in a have to universe. We think we have to. We learned the words I have to when we were little kids. And it was important then. And there are always two other words attached to it that created fear or else, or else something bad will happen. And the truth is, when you think about it, everything is a choice except perhaps dying. Everything else is a choice. And so when you sh shift in your mind from, I have to do this, I have to make it, I have to get these events booked to, I want to, I choose to, I like to, I love to, I can't wait to. It's a whole different perspective because you stop looking in the rear view mirror at that fear of, or else, what if I don't make it happen? So when I, I remember just really, really strongly that when I decided that I was going to go for professional speaking, it was not a fear-based thing. It was, I sure, you know, I'm hoping that there's water on the other side of this diving board. But ultimately, I had this incredible feeling that I don't know how it's all going to turn out, but I know it's going to work. And it was really that from that lifetime of really pursuing that I have a choice. Uh, you know, there's consequences to every choice. And then you have a choice about how you respond to that. But truly, more than anything else, it was a, a faith that I will find a way because I love it. Um, and I really believe that I can get better and better and better each time I get out there. And it's what I was hit, put on this earth to do. And so that's really where it came from. Choose to rather than have to. Oh, that is the probably the best point in this show, but I bet you there are plenty more, but I will just pause a second. I am in the exact same place. I believe I want, I need all those positive words and, and what you just said about have to. And I think people should pause a little bit and think about what either they are saying or what they, others, you hear them saying to understand is their heart totally into it or is more of a compliance thing because one you're existing, the other one you're actually living. One more question before we go on. So you said, I go, I'm going to be all in. I believe, I know, I'll figure this out. What was those early days that you were able to finally start getting some of those gigs or opportunities or working with companies that says, I got this thing, or I think this engine is starting to move and I can continue? Well, you know, for me, I was, I was very blessed because I had two clients in the first couple of years that booked me over a hundred times between the two of them. Uh, one was one of the bigger companies in the world, Remax, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a huge real estate company. And the other was a direct sales company. And I, I also have this deep belief that I, I really encourage you to take ownership of, steal it. <laughs> and that is, is that every single connection, every single presentation, every single Every single time you get a chance to to work on your on your your craft is a seed, and some of them will plant right away. Some of them will bloom right away, and some of them may stay underground for a while. But by having that that vision that everything I do is a seed, it's planting. Um, the result of that has been an incredibly wonderful career because all of my 1900 events have come via word of mouth. Um, and it was the those seeds that were planted initially just in those two. And then I had a couple of other events that were um, that had leaders from all different kinds of organizations that just exploded the business. So I, I think that really, if you come from that place of look at everything you do is a seed, whether you see it sprout it right away or not, then you know that um, you may never know how it, where it comes from. But it's it's working in there. It is combining with the elements that are going to lead you to to a successful speaking career. So this is refreshing as well as, I don't know, calming me down <laughs> or encouraging me. And again, like I said, I get inspired by these conversations because even this weekend I was at a curling conference. You know, I am a curler and I had to go up front for five minutes and give my committee report. But you know what I did was I dressed to the nines, even though everybody was kind of casual, I dressed up like I was going to be on the stage. I walked up and normally I'm just a bit nervous because you never know what's going to happen. I was completely calm. 
And then I delivered our team's vision. I delivered our updates. I delivered emotion. And then I had people coming up after me like, Deb, I love your voice. Oh my God, that was so good. But I treated it like an opportunity to speak, even though it was five minutes, because you never know who's watching, listening, who's inspired, and might be that next opportunity. So you're singing to my heart, but <laughs> I'd love to get back. I want to get back to you. Oh my God, <laughs> 16 books and traveling around the world and speaking. Tell me, I mean, what, what is your favorite topic? I mean, I'm sure there are plenty, but like, what have you so enjoyed from all of this speaking and all the people that you've connected with? Well, you know, uh, the foundation of what I believe and what I love, what I do so much is that everyone is a leader. You know, uh, this, this program really aims at that C-suite leader, but really every person is a self-leader. How do you show up every day? That's a big part of leadership. How do you deal with adversity, with challenge, with change? Huge part of leadership, probably most important of all. What kind of impact do you have on the people around you? Do you lift them? Do you hold them steady? Do you put them down? So the the the, the love that I have is though I speak about leadership, it's very, it, immediately most people kind of think of separation, that there's leaders and there's followers. My My standpoint is we're all leaders and that, the messages that I give to the, the CEO are in many ways the same lessons I give to the newest employee because when that newest employee, that, that receptionist is speaking to a, a, that first client, they are that company. Um, they are right there. And so the principles that I teach, I love because I believe they have as much impact wherever you are in an organization and every bit as much impact on your family, on your relationships, on your health, um, on your spirit. Um, and ultimately that's what gives me the juice because I've spoken to virtually every level in an organization. I've spoken to huge crowds. I've spoken to small retreats, but every single time it's coming from the same place. You are a leader. So let's develop the keys to making you be, be a, what I call a breakthrough leader because ultimately that's the business we're all in. That's why you do this and wonderful podcast is to help people break through, help yourself break through meet new people, find new ideas, apply new ideas. And that's why I love breakthroughs. How do you break through from fear to freedom, from failure to faith, from ego to we go, and from good to great? Uh, wow. Most of all, how can you make, make breakthroughs in your life, in your leadership, in your health, in your family, planable, not just possible? And so that always gets me excited because I love to get people into the game of breaking through. So we're going to spend some more time there, but where your comments so resonate with me, I actually have this speaking point about why can't everybody be a high performer? We hire great people into an organization and then come review time, they put everybody in a nine box. Those people that are the high achievers, you groom them for the next level, the low performers, the bottom 10%, how are we going to exit them? And then you got your steady eddies in the middle that we might not want to develop them because they are the hub of the organization and we don't want to lose them. And, and I keep looking at, you know, leadership. Why didn't everybody have an opportunity to succeed? Did we not take the time to get to know? Anyway, I could go on and on. So resonate. Everybody's a leader. And if not in the workplace, they could be a leader in their community. They could be a leader at home or in service to other people. Everybody has a leader in them. I, yeah, everybody should be. <laughs> it's so true. And um, I've gotten a little off track here because what you say is so resonating with me, but I want to go a little bit deeper into what you talk about breakthrough, because I think everybody wants a bolt of lightning to hit them, an aha moment, an opportunity just to show up in front of them. But I would love for you to extrapolate a little bit because you were like so easy, like, oh, you can go from here to here, here to here. Go a little bit deeper in what is needed to help someone break through from to. I love it. Um and I think that this is the part that is most out of the way that we, we most of us have been conditioned. Um, we tend to want to have breakthroughs and think of them from the outside in rather than the inside out. And one of the most powerful ways to ignite more breakthroughs in your life is to start to focus on controlling your controllables. Um, most of us, see, whenever, you're, whenever you're controlling your controllables, you feel momentum, you feel confidence, you feel you can. It's when we try to control the things that we have no control over that we get frustrated, we get disappointed, we get fearful, we give up. And so over 
a lifetime, 48 years of really doing the same thing, which is building people, teams, and relationships. It's become clear to me that there are three foundational controllables that when we put our focus on them, see, when we think of breakthroughs, we think of results and we want those results. But what we need to focus on is what we put in to create those results. Um, and, you know, right behind me on in my room here is uh, my mentor was the greatest college basketball coach of all time. His name was John Wooden. Uh, people are, you know, Ted Lasso fans. His pyramid of success, the one right behind me, was on the wall of Ted Lasso for those who are a Ted Lasso fan. But John Wooden created the most success ever in his in his field by far. I mean, by double. And yet he never said the words winning or losing to his players. Now, did he want to win? Oh, yes. But what he wanted was for his players to control their controllables. And there really are three keys. The first uh, is to shape your future. So that's about vision. All breakthroughs start with vision. You have to see it before you can be it. And so and when I'm speaking, I'm one of the foundations that I always bring in is how do you create, how do you use vision to, to ignite breakthroughs? Um, because you got to start with the end in mind. The second is to energize and engage your team. And before you can energize and engage anybody else, obviously you must energize and engage yourself. So much of human performance, so much of business performance, team performance, leadership performance is about your energy. People won't remember that much about what you say and they will never forget your energy. People watch your podcast and they see this elegant, curious, um, articulate woman who is, and they get that energy no matter what comes out. They might, they may remember one or two little points, but what they get is the energy that's teaching them those things that I just spoke about, that how important it is to try to articulate what, what's your, important for you to say, how to really create a, gen, a, 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 a genuine curiosity because that's how we grow and learn. So that second key is how do you energize and engage the people around you? You know, every year the Gallup poll people do a, a, a study called the state of the American workforce. And what they're looking for is, and they're measuring, is the level of engagement of American employees across all industries. So every single industry, tech, manufacturing, any industry, and only 24%, and that's kind of an average over the last 15 years, are fully engaged, which means they have full energy. Their spirit is, oh yeah, whatever you throw at them, it's, oh yeah, we got some tough challenges ahead. Oh yeah. That means 76% of American employees across every industry are either just okay, which is somewhat engaged, which means they're somewhat not engaged, or actively disengaged, which is an oh no spirit. Things are going to be great around here this year. Oh no. All right. So how do you flip that around? Well, so much of that is about energy. And we know that when employees and team members are engaged, their productivity soars at least 40%, even more. So the second of those controllables, is how do you develop energy by choice instead of chance? And I talk a lot about that. And the third is that we're all in the people business is how do you build people, build teams and build relationships? Um, again, it's how, how you grow and help others grow that will determine how far you go. Now, when you focus on those three controllables, and that's the secret, you want results, but you focus on what you control to move towards those results. Then you're going to start to generate what I call breakthrough results. And breakthrough results are doing things that when you started out, you had no idea you could accomplish that. But here's the best part about focusing in that kind of leadership on the internal, those three controllables. As you shape the future, as you engage, as you energize and engage your team and yourself, as you build people, teams, and relationships, you'll start to develop more of those breakthrough results. But eventually, uh, by sticking with that focus, breakthrough leadership moves from the outside to the inside to who you become, which is a model of personal excellence, integrity, accountability, and humility. And perhaps the most important one, Deb, of all of those is the one that's never taught, and that's humility. Now, being humble in this world today, some people have got the false idea that being humble is somehow weak, is somehow uh, that you can't be confident and be humble. It's absolutely not true. You can be incredibly humble and incredib incredibly confident because being humble doesn't mean you think less of yourself. It means you think of yourself less. But the real key why humility is so crucial to a breakthrough leader is only those who are humble are lifelong learners. 
Because only those who are humble are always looking to learn something. They always believe there's more to learn. Only those who are humble will give credit and take responsibility. Only those who are humble are focused on their character more than their reputation. Because your character is who you are. Reputation only what others think you are. And if you stick with that focus on controlling your controllables, your, your character and your reputation will merge and become one. So what is comforting about what you said is that humbleness. So I was a few moments ago, totally present and immersed in what you were saying. And I was starting to summarize. And then I said, I'm not sure where this is going because I lost track of my train of thought. But that I think was a humble moment for me, knowing I wasn't perfect. I wasn't on my game ready with the next question because I truly was learning and being inspired by you because a lot of what you're saying is so resonating with releasing myself from what I had to do versus what really drives my soul and my passion. And it, it is, that is a breakthrough for people. If you have never experienced joy or that energy from within, I mean, I certainly hope one has experienced that with family and friends, possibly doing good work on behalf of them. It's not just about your career, but ultimately that is why we're here again to, we are living, breathing be, being, you know, to leave our legacy, um, but also for ourselves. Now, quick story on my side, as I was a coming up in my career, I had to deal with a vice president and they were all about spending time with the people and making sure they had what they needed and training. And I would go to their office and say, we haven't finished this action item. What do we do next? And I was in the mode of results and I was celebrated for results. That's how I was groomed. And only now do I realize the results are an effect or an outcome of supporting the people giving them what they need to be successful, making sure they clearly understand the purpose and the how, why they're doing what they're doing. And then you get the exponential results. So lesson to everybody, it's not about results. You are a servant leader, a people leader. You are here to leave your legacy and elevate those around you. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. One of my favorite quotes really sums that up. It's from a woman named Wilma Rudolph. Now, maybe, maybe many of your folks don't know who she was, but uh, Wilma Rudolph was the greatest woman track star in 1960 in the Olympics. She won three gold medals. Um, she actually had polio when she was a little girl and was told she would never walk. Her first 200 races, um, when she was actually came through three years of intense, intense physical therapy to just be able to walk. And then she said, I'm going to grow up to be the fastest runner in the world. And everybody laughed at her. Her first 200 races, Deb, she finished last every single race, but she never gave up. And in 1960 in Rome, she won three gold medals. Here's what she said. And this is the essence of a servant leader. She said, and think about it, because this is a person who really was in an quote unquote individual sport, all right, who obviously could come from a place of look what I did. What she said was, no matter what you ever accomplish in your life, know this powerful truth. Somebody always helps you. And that is the essence of understanding that we can't do it alone. All right. And the more that we build the people around us, the more it comes back. It's a circle. It, it completes us as well. So whenever you seek to enrich another person's experience, you can't help but enrich your own. So it's a win-win. So that's why we do these podcasts. Again, I'm in the moment right now because you are inspiring me. I've been trying and working hard and I know the people I've connected with. I have impacted in one way or another. They let me know. Um, but there's so many people out there that I want to impact. I want to help. Maybe I am and I just don't know them yet. But you give me faith and discipline to play the long game because that's why we're here. It's to do it for ourselves. And if in the process, other people benefit, so be it. That's our legacy here. But um, <laughs> Debbie's having a moment. <laughs> but let's come back to you. Uh, your new book, uh, Lessons from the Legend, and you loved it. Um, 16 books. Oh, my. <laughs> I'm just trying to get started with my second book. But kudos to you for reading writing 16 books. But your brand new book, tell us a little bit about Lessons from the Legends and Loved It and your motivation for writing such book. Because once you've done 15, there's a 16. Are there more behind that as well? <laughs> well, I'm kind of a streak writer. So when I get the idea, it comes. Uh -huh. I wrote a book about kindness because I, I really felt the world needs more kindness. And this book, Lessons from the Legend, I wrote with a very specific purpose, a passion, if you will. And that was, this is a book about character. 
it looks at two incredible teachers, coaches, leaders. Uh, one was one I mentioned before, John Wooden. Um, John Wooden, just for, for perspective, his teams at UCLA won 10 national championships. No other coach in men's basketball history has won more than five. But talk about humble. He would have been the first to tell you he didn't win any in the first 27 years that he coached. He used to say, it's what you learn after you know everything that makes the difference. And the other legend that I write about was to women's basketball, what John Wooden was to men's basketball. And her name was Pat Summit. And Pat Summit coached the University of Tennessee, women's, they're called the Lady Vols. And she died from um, early onset Alzheimer's, but she created so much momentum to try to find a cure to that. The reason I wrote it is that the two of them were incredibly different in their style. John Wooden was very, very gentlemanly, grandfatherly. He never, I think the harshest words he might've ever said were good grief. Um, you know, he was, he was, uh, he got his point across. He was confident, but he was very humble, very gentle, very clear spoken. Pat Summit could melt your screen with her icy look. She was tough as nails, but they were so similar on the, on what was inside of them. They were both breakthrough leaders. They both did the things we just talked about. They were all about controlling your controllables, focusing on what you do control. They both believed strongly that they coached people. In fact, both of them saw themselves as teachers more than coaches, that really leadership is about teaching. Uh, and they both, uh, though totally different styles, a man and a woman, one from the West, one from the East, I right, always gave credit. See, it's amazing what's accomplished when nobody cares who gets the credit. Credit is something you give, responsibility is something you take. So I wrote this book with these two very different on the outside, but very similar on the inside, magnificent leaders and teachers, because both of them were all about character. That's what they believed in. John Wooden would say, your character is who you are, your reputation only what others think you are. And I felt like in this world, we're, we're so often caught up in, in hype and about glitz. And I wanted people to get back to the things that matter, your integrity, all right, your industriousness, which is your work ethic, your enthusiasm, um, and that it can come in different forms. But when you focus on your character, then you really make the long-term impact on other people. So um, that's why I wrote this book. And it's filled with really cool stories about, about um, people from sport, from entertainment, from business, current people that, pe that the reader will relate to that bring alive the principles that these two absolutely lived by every single day. Um, they were very similar. John Wooden had the pyramid of success, which you see. Pat Summit had something called the definite dozen. And though they were coaching basketball, these were all about being the best personal, best person you could be, the best leader you could be, the best teammate you could be. So inspirational, <laughs> Brian. I really appreciate this. And I was smiling while you were sharing your story. And by the way, you're an amazing storyteller. So thank you for that. And I'm thinking about my husband and I, and after our first date, I looked at him, I said, why did you ask me out? We are so different in our upbringings and our outside persona. But over the years, <laughs> our values are the same. And there's nothing better than the unity of a husband and wife. So when the kids say, hey, daddy, can I have this? And they say no. And then they go to mommy and they say, what did dad say? We are a unified front. And while my kids were probably very frustrated, they knew they couldn't go around us as they become. <laughs> Um, young adults, they are coming back to us and say, you know, we really appreciate, you know, dinner at 630. We really appreciate what you instilled in us because we're seeing our friends making bad choices. So it comes down to that character of they may not have liked us. We may have been different and I might have been softer, my husband a little sterner, depending on the situation. But the core of it all is our children learned life lessons that they're now taking with them. That is so important to bring up such a vital point. We've made the word differences something bad. But I don't want a team of people who are just like me because we won't see very much. We'll see only that narrow funnel that I see. I want people who have skills that I don't have. I want people with, with talents that I don't have, with passions in areas I don't. Because what really matters, we talk a lot about being like-minded. I'm more about being like-hearted um, because... I want people who have such, such talents that fill in my gaps and vice versa. Um, when I was a, a vice president in the transportation industry, the VP of operations, I ran marketing and sales. The VP of operations had his room right next door to me. 
and we were as different as different could be. I was all about get out there with the people and, you know, it was all about we can make this happen. And he was very analytical. He, an he analyzed everything. But one day I went into his office and, and we were separated. That was part of the silo challenge. One day I walked around the corner into his office, sat down and was just present with him. And I found out we were like hearted. He cared about the people every bit as much as I did. He cared about it. He loved his family. We had so many things that we could connect with. And from that day on, we those differences became pluses because we supported each other from the heart, knowing that we both were going to the same end, just as you did with your with your children, is that, hey, what we want is for you to grow into great people who have faith and confidence and that you can make this life a great life. We don't want to dictate what you do. We just want to help you to develop yourself to your true potential. And that way, we've got to value and honor those differences. Let's be like-hearted. When we do that, those differences shine. What an amazing statement, but I love that like heart, like hearted, like hearted, because we are more alike than we are different. Differences are not a bad thing. So, oh my God, again, so inspired here that I have to remember what's my next question here, but honestly, you've got so many, so many speaking topics. I want to bring this one forward because again, we think about overnight success. What's the secret sauce? How do we become that perfect leader? But you just talk in general about the secret behind the secrets. And I would love to know more about that. To me, um, Deb, this is the most important thing that I teach um, because breakthroughs require relationship. Breakthroughs require um, really helping one another know that they're important. And the most important thing, thing I teach is the only way that we can help others truly know they're important, that we can really build trust. And ultimately, it is also the secret to life balance. And it's called being fully present. Now, what does that mean? When you're fully present with someone, as you are on this show, it's one of your greatest strengths. When you're fully present, 100% of your mind, body, and spirit is with the person you're with where they are now. Uh, and we've all been around people when, when we know their body's present, but the rest of them is in another county. And here's a question. How does it make you feel when someone you wish to be present with you is not fully present with you? Some people make them a little angry. But most people, it makes them feel sad or small. But for everyone I've ever known, when there's somebody we really want to be present with us and they're not, it makes us feel worth less. It makes us feel insignificant and unimportant. And here's the job, whether you're the CEO or that breakthrough leader who's just starting out in a company, our job, I believe more than any other, is to help the people that we lead, that we serve, that we care about, to know they're important to know they're significant, to know they can make a difference, to know they matter. Because when people feel important, they rise to an oh yeah spirit. And when people feel unimportant, they fall to oh no. So how do you do that? How do you help people know they're important in the first 30 seconds when you meet them? How do you help people know they're important when you're working through difficult issues? How do you help people know they're important where they know your tricks and you can't fake them out? It all comes down to being fully present because when we're present, we say to that person, Beyond words, you are important. Uh, quick little story to bring that out. When, when I was in the corporate world as the VP general manager of this very uh, ma major international training company, I inherited my director of operations. She had the greatest name ever. Her name is Raffaella Regina Rossi. Right? And uh, we call her R3. And when I became her boss, she detested me, which I was not used to because I love people. But the reason was I had replaced somebody she had been very loyal to. And she had construed that I had something to do with it, which was not true, but that's the way she took it. Now, for a while, we tried to pretend we had a decent relationship. How effective do you think that was with everybody? Everybody knew they could feel the tension and we were floundering, doing nothing. I tried giving her compliments, that didn't work. I tried giving her space, that didn't work. I tried giving direction, nothing worked until I remembered my job, your job, our job which was to be present, to help her know she was significant. So I asked her to come in my office one day and I was dead dirt honest with her. I said, Raffaella, our team is floundering because I haven't been a good enough leader to find a way for you and I to break through. So I've asked you here today to do something. I know at first it'll sound a little odd, but I have a reason. I said, if you will allow me for 10 minutes, I will just listen to you. You have a free pass. You can say whatever you want, however you want to say it. I will not interrupt. I will not defend. I will not argue. I will not ask. I will just listen. I said, 
All I ask is after 10 minutes, if you would do the same for me and give me 10 minutes. And I'll never forget Raffaella's answer, Deb. She said, Brian, I don't think I could talk for 10 minutes. I said, Raffaella, we just got to get better. And she wanted it better every bit as much as I did. So finally she goes, well, okay, I'll try. An hour later, she stopped talking. And in that hour, I just listened. In other words, I was fully present. And in that hour, without saying a word, she transformed our entire team. She realized she hadn't been fair to me, hadn't given me a chance. She realized that if we put our energies together, we'd be pretty unstoppable. Most of all, she reminded herself of how much she loved what we could be and should be doing, but weren't doing because of our stuff. When we walked out of that room an hour later, over the next six months, we got more done and had more fun doing it in that organization than they had in the previous three years. To this day, Raffaella is one of, 35 years later, she's one of my dearest friends. Even though I never got my 10 minutes, she still owes me 10 minutes. But in that hour of being present, I was finally able to communicate what I had failed dismally to do before. By being present and only by being present, I was able to communicate to her, you're important, you matter and you count. And whenever we're not present, we speak louder. So to me, the, 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 I call it the gift because whether it's at work or at home, nothing is, is more important than helping the people around you to know they're important. And, and this is why it's the secret to life balance. Let's put it, let's clear this life balance thing up right away. You're not gonna have equal time. Most people think in terms of life balance of equal time. There's still only 24 hours and there's still 48 hours of stuff to do in that time. But five minutes of being fully present with another person is worth five weeks of faking it. And you can't fake it. You know, how many, how, do you know when you're with somebody if they're fully present or not? Sure, right away. Can you tell, can you tell over the phone if you're talking to them, if they're watching ESPN? You know, being fully present is not a technique. It's a choice. It's another want to, choose to, like to, love to. So if you want to change your life, pick out two people in your life for, for the next 30 days you commit to be more fully present with. Uh, doesn't mean you have to spend more time with them. You may have less time, but put the cell phone down, shut off the television, ask more than tell, and then listen before you formulate your response and you watch. That connection will build like never before. So thank you for all of that because I also was one of those people who was not fully present because of my DNA, get things done, multitasking. And I hit a wall once when I had left corporate and I was trying to connect with community. And I went out with a lady for breakfast and I said, you know, you see me. I was asking her for some feedback because I was on some self-discovery and she says, well, you know, Deb, you seem when you show up at our parties and stuff, you're very busy and we understand that, but I said, but you're not fully present. And at that time, I didn't quite realize it, but she had the courage to say it to me. And I would say that was the beginning of the end, because now when I show up in front of you or anybody in this virtual world here, I, I am fully present and I'll hear things like, well, I'm not, or I, I love doing this. And when we're done, I summarize what I see in that human about, oh my goodness, you should be at the next level. Oh, I was so inspired by that. And they're totally taken aback because I was able to be so present. I was able to distill their essence and share with them that I cared enough to say, this is who you are and how I see you. And they're just delayed, delighted by it. It's a wonderful experience. And if people listening are not experiencing that because they're trying to get everything done, you're missing out on life and human connection. You are present. so right. I can see your presence here on on uh, on this virtual uh, virtual event, and I want to bring it home okay. because the reason why this is so dear to me and why I call being fully present the ultimate gift. Uh, when my two children, my two daughters, were eight and three, Kelsey and Jenna, I was just like you. I was my speaking business had taken off. I was taking on this big, huge contract. I was on the road at least twenty days a month, um, and when I was home, I wasn't fully home. Um, I was thinking about the next conference call. This, But one night, my two daughters walked in my office when I could have been tucking them in. One of the most beautiful and special moments with our kids, because it doesn't last forever. They grow up. And it's when we, the last thing we leave them each night is to let them know that they're loved, that they're important, that they're special. But I was reaching for my phone like every night, and my daughters walked in my office and said, Daddy, we just want to know. Do you love your phone more than you love us? Oh. 
I felt the blade going deep. You know, Emerson said, what we do scream so loudly, I can't hear a word you're saying. And I realized I was, my phone had been a higher priority than my children and my wife. Well, I will let you know, I tucked them in that night and I never missed another night after that. The next morning, it was me who got them up, made them breakfast, brought them to school. And my wife was the happiest person on the planet because she's not a morning girl. And I never missed another morning after that when I was home. And when I came home that day from dropping at school, I made a choice, a breakthrough presence choice. I said, I will never, ever, ever uh, book more than seven events a month from here on out. I don't care what you pay me, I won't do it. That my calendar would start with my family. And I lived at Deb all the years after that when my girls were growing up. I never missed one of their dance performances. I never missed one of their big events at school. I never missed one of those awesome daddy and daughter dances. And I thought I was doing it for them. Do you know that every element of our life professionally as much as personally flourished with the decision to be more fully present? Because again, you don't get less done when you're present. You get way more done because you're focused and present in that moment. And so uh, I love this, bring it alive with a poem. It says, the past is history, the future a mystery. The gift is now. That's why we call it the present. With that, Brian, I am so inspired. And you and I are going to chit chat when we get off this recording on how this is so resonated. But I want to just, first of all, thank you for being so present, providing so much value, inspiring me, and hopefully inspiring my audience. Um, I want to give you the floor just one last moment for any last thoughts for our audiences. Well, again, I think that what we just covered at the end is the one thing I encourage you more than any. Nothing nothing as a leader is more important than being fully present. You know, uh, when I was with John Wooden, he was the greatest of all time. He was my friend. I always felt like I was the important one because he was so present with me. So you have that choice, that it's a choice. And ultimately, when you recognize choice, you can become unstoppable. Um, you know, recognize that you have a choice to be present, to give, re to give credit, take responsibility, um, that you have, that your energy is a choice and that to everyone you touch, your energy is your example. Mm. Such beautiful words. I am so inspired by this conversation, Brian. I want to thank you so much for dropping in on the podcast. And I do want to wish you well and continue success. Thank you so much. Anybody interested in having me come and speak, which is my passion. I joke about it, Deb, but when I'm on stage, I'm 25. I get off stage, I'm 70, but on stage, I'm 25. Um, and uh, my website is just my name, www.brianbyro.com. It's got my books, it's got my speaking, and it's what I'm here on earth to do. All right. Thank you again, Brian, and you be well.